welcome back to another one of your flip lectures. Today we're going to talk about some changes in the American political makeup as we talk about Andrew Jackson and Jacksonian America. So after the War of 1812, there are a couple of elections that take place that aren't really all that controversial. James Monroe is the president after James Madison, and he's very popular, and he's elected to two terms, and kind of his presidency is this era of good feelings that we talked about. But after him, there's a very tightly contested presidential race that's going to result in John Quincy Adams being elected to president through a corrupt bargain. And when we talk about the corrupt bargain, we're talking about the idea that the election is not decided by a popular vote or even by the Electoral College, but it's going to actually be decided because two of the candidates agree to kind of join forces to allow one to be elected president in exchange for a favor. And so in this election of 1824, you have the hero Andrew Jackson running against John Quincy Adams, who was a well-known political figure at the time. You also have a couple of other people running, such as Henry Clay and William Crawford. Because so many candidates run, no candidate actually wins a majority in the Electoral College. According to United States law, if the Electoral College doesn't produce a winner, then the president will be decided by the the vote in the House of Representatives. And so when the vote comes down to the House of the Representatives, what happens is all these candidates have to figure out how they're going to get a majority vote. And what John Quincy Adams does is he makes a deal with Henry Clay where in exchange for Henry Clay's supporters voting for John Quincy Adams to be president, Qu Quincy Adams then made Henry Clay the Secretary of State. And so Jackson supporters saw this and they called it a corrupt bargain. That basically John Quincy Adams had bought the presidency by exchanging a high office in exchange for kind of these votes. And so Andrew Jackson's supporters are waiting four years to run Andrew Jackson again and finally defeat John Quincy Adams. And so in 1828, there's a rematch between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. And this election of 1828 represents in a lot of ways kind of a new spirit of American politics. Voting rights had been expanded in the years leading up to 1828. And so you have a lot more people involved, and especially a lot more kind of common people who are living in kind of the West. And so this election, in order to capture these new voters, you see kind of for the first time these kind of mass campaigns, parades through the streets with the candidates, um, signs, they held parties, the fun kind with food and drink for their supporters. And also kind of with this new type of campaigning, you also see mudslinging, dirty campaign tactics really kind of ramping up during this time. And so in a lot of ways, this is kind of the emergence of modern politics, where John Quincy Adams supporters published documents saying that a Andrew Jackson, when he was a general, had executed a number of soldiers, that he had murdered people in duels. And so they said that such a savage, violent man should not be present and couldn't really be trusted. On the other hand, Jackson supporters basically trumpet Andrew Jackson as the hero of two wars in the Battle of New Orleans, right, 1812 and the Seminole Wars. They say that he is a man of the people, a commoner, who did not barter and bargain for the presidency. And so basically Andrew Jackson supporters, calling him Old Hickory because he wouldn't bend or break and he could be counted on, would kind of talk about John Quincy Adams and say how he had bought the presidency. And they came up with kind of a whole negative campaign to talk about John Quincy Adams. And so kind of the result of all this negative campaigning is kind of a really divided country that is going to have to go to the polls and vote. But so all those negative advertisements you guys saw on TV during the election, those are all actually very old. There's nothing new. The only thing that's new is television. And so in 1828, Andrew Jackson actually wins this next election. He gets 56% of the popular vote, a large percentage. Also, 68% of the Electoral College. So this is what we would call a landslide. Jackson's popularity as a war hero, as well as his image as kind of a common man, a man of the people, really kind of contributed to this massive victory in 1828. And on top of that, Jackson was smart, and he got a politician called John C. Calhoun, from the South to be his vice president in order to make sure that he would get some of the votes in the South. And so Andrew Jackson got elected and John C. Calhoun to be his vice president. Kind of the funny thing about John C. Calhoun is that he and Jackson actually hated each other. And they're going to kind of have a number of disagreements we're going to talk about in our run-up to the American Civil War. 
But kind of the funny thing about Andrew Jackson is that kind of the myth around him was that he was the common man, that he was a Westerner, that he represented this idea of kind of pioneer independence. But actually the reality of Andrew Jackson is he was a wealthy slave owner. They called him Old Hickory because they said that he kind of stood firm. But he was also known as being uncompromising and prideful. He was well known for dueling when he felt that someone had kind of offended his honor. He would challenge them to a duel. And actually he shot several people in the course of these duels and was shot himself. And also, Andrew Jackson was very inexperienced. He didn't really have a lot of experience kind of, at, kind of in government. And so kind of the myth about Jackson that was put forth by his campaign is actually very successful in getting him elected, but it didn't always represent kind of the reality. And to just to kind of bring this up, to kind of demonstrate that kind of our current political discourse as well, there are a lot of things like this as well, where kind of the reality does not match kind of the campaign that is put out, both positive and negative. So once Jackson was elected president, it was very clear that he was going to do things very differently than the people who came before him. The president's cabinet was usually, usually has to be approved by the Congress, where the president is supposed to pick experts, and then the Congress is supposed to kind of decide if those experts are fair or if they are kind of just going to give the president um, advice that he wants to hear. Andrew Jackson didn't really much care for the separation of powers. He didn't really much care for the checks and balances. And so what he did is he just got a couple of his closest friends to be his advisors, and he called them the kitchen cabinet, where he didn't actually consult the um, kind of experts that Congress had approved. He just kind of consulted his friends. He also believed in the idea of the spoils system. The spoils system is basically patronage where once you get elected, rather than kind of hiring the most qualified people, you kind of hire all of your friends and supporters and put them in government office. The idea is that to the victors go the spoils, and so basically he rewarded his supporters with government jobs. Jackson was also well known for his forceful use of executive power. You kind of see the political cartoon shows him as a monarch, and the document that he is standing on that's all shredded up is the Constitution. Um, under Andrew Jackson, a number of the powers of the presidency kind of increase. The force bill is passed to allow for the government to use military power to enforce laws in the states. That's going to be very important when we talk about the Civil War, but it's kind of just another example of kind of Andrew Jackson expanding executive power. He also ignored several Supreme Court decisions. We already talked about Indian removal, in which the Supreme Court ruled that that law um, could not be kind of followed through, but Jackson did anyway. And also, the first bank, sorry, the second bank of the United States, Jackson hated the central bank. He believed that it was a tool for the wealthy to kind of get wealthier. He didn't believe in the value of it. And so Jackson single-handedly killed the bank. The Supreme Court had ruled the bank was constitutional, but Andrew Jackson, by taking all the government money out of that bank, actually forced that bank to close. And so kind of Andrew Jackson's presidency is really kind of known for kind of the expansion of executive power and kind of the contraction or shrinking of kind of some of these checks and balances um, that were kind of designed in the Constitution. And so kind of overall, what we talk about when we talk about Jacksonian America is that this time of Andrew Jackson represents a change in United States politics. It meant more participation for ordinary Americans kind of in the political system as voting rights kind of got expanded, as now regions like the West, as well as kind of the more common people who didn't own land, their votes began to count. And this ushers in kind of a new political um, kind of landscape. Then also kind of the West becomes an important political region. Jackson wins by kind of getting the Western vote and kind of future presidents are also going to look to get that vote to get into power. And then ultimately Jacksonian America kind of represents a time in which the power and role of the president as well as the federal government as opposed to the states is really going to increase. Because what Jackson does is he pushes the boundaries of executive power and the American public kind of allows the presidency under Andrew Jackson to exercise that power. And so kind of today we talk about presidents having a lot of kind of power to do things. Kind of a lot of those things kind of date back to Jacksonian America. And so kind of from here, we're going to skip a few years in United States history. But in the years kind of after Jackson, from 1836 to 1844, there's a couple of things that are going on. Firstly, immigration is increasing in massive numbers from Ireland and Germany. There's going to be a famine in Ireland that is going to basically push a lot of Irish out. And kind of with that, immigration 
the country is going to see an increase in size. Also during this time, the abolition movement, the movement to end slavery in the United States, starts to pick up a lot of supporters and a lot of steam. And then finally, kind of there's a couple presidents in there, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, and John Tyler. But these presidents kind of preside over a period of kind of relative calm in U.S. history. That kind of not a lot of big cataclysmic events are happening, except that the country is expanding kind of both in population and territory, as well as kind of with economic growth. And so at this point in U.S. history, the U.S. The US is a young country, it is growing, and and kind of with that, further problems are going to arise that result from that growth.